This is my 900 horsepower electric escape project that I'm building because of a bus. If that doesn't make sense to you, it's because you didn't watch the previous video, so you should go watch that now. For everybody else, let's continue. This is a Tesla base large drive unit. Ah, you got me. It's a poorly 3D printed representation of one, and it only took me a month to print. This was used in the early Tesla Model S and Model X, although it's not used in them anymore, and it was also used in the Toyota RAV4 EV and the Mercedes B250e, both of which were compliance cars that their manufacturers wanted nothing to do with, so they said, hey, Tesla, you're good at this stuff, do electric. As I mentioned in the last video, this unit is capable of 450 horsepower, although it never made that much in production form for various reasons, mostly because of battery power output. In the RAV4 EV, it was limited all the way down to 154 horsepower. In the Mercedes, it was limited to 134 horsepower. Talk about being kneecapped. Actually, no, don't talk about being kneecapped. It's a dreadful topic of conversation. But this isn't a production environment. This is the aftermarket, and this is a replacement control board for a base large drive unit like this one made by AEM. This replaces the stock control board here in the inverter and allows full control and access of the drive unit. None of that spoofing the stock control board to make it think it's still in a Tesla. No, this is my drive unit and I'm gonna tell it exactly what I want it to do. By the way, quick anatomy of a Tesla large drive unit. This is the motor, three phase induction motor. This is the inverter, insanely inefficiently packaged. This is what takes the direct current from the batteries and jiggles the pixies around and converts it into three phase alternating current for the motor. And this bit in the middle is the gearbox. Single speed gear reduction, 9.7 to one. And the differential is right here. CV shafts come out here and go to the wheels. Drive unit. As impressive as it may be to get 450 horsepower out of something this small that only weighs 250 pounds, this is now old technology. The drive unit from Elucid is this big, only weighs 160 pounds, still has the gearbox inverter and motor all in one, and it's capable of 670 horsepower. But weirdly, there's no 10 year old crash Lucids on the market yet, so I'll be using this one. <laughs> The rear drive unit needs to go right about here. This looks in the way, so it go bye bye. There's so much room now. I done goofed. This motor mount doesn't fit. It's about half a millimeter too narrow which I could hammer it on, but I'm not gonna do that. I could also angle grind this face down half a millimeter or a quarter of a millimeter on either side, but there's no way I could do that evenly. Instead, I'm just gonna remake this whole part and I'm gonna do it completely differently this time. I'm gonna use technology. Well, I'm a moron and forgot to hit record. So this one cut out. This one didn't cut out all the way. There was just this little bit here. So I'm gonna cut it out again so you can see what I did. I am officially bad at this. There's not enough clearance here. I mean, it will clear, but just barely. And there is nowhere near enough clearance on this side. So I need to cut off here and here. And the geese also agree that I'm an idiot. After seemingly endless clearancing and retesting, I ended up with this shape. And if you're thinking, that looks awfully spindly, just remember, this will be braced on multiple sides. It'll be welded in place. And I made this out of steel that is about twice as thick as is actually necessary. Okay, I clamped this on the drive unit mount with the shim to ensure proper spacing. But when I welded the inside corners here, it shrank and now it's exactly the same width, i.e. too small, as the failed one from earlier. So I failed twice. Time for attempt number three.
so I don't end up with another mount that fits too tightly on here. I'm going to bolt this in place with this spacer that I just cut out on the arc droid here to add just a little bit of space in between and then weld it in situ. I got the spacing right on this one and it only took three tries. That is not going anywhere. So I hope I didn't make a mistake. You know, I want this to be a mega sleeper and for it to look like nothing other than an ordinary escape, but you're gonna see that. I'll have to hide that at some point, maybe with a black sheet of plastic or something, but that's a problem for later. Welcome, <laughs> Welcome back to my kitchen from the 70s. This is Sybil. This video is brought to you by Factor. Factor is ready to eat meals delivered straight to your door. Factor meals are as easy as slide off the cardboard sleeve, vent with your puncturing implement of choice, Throw it in the microwave, wait two minutes, and just like that you've got a delicious fresh meal ready to enjoy. I saw a comment on the last video that called these TV dinners. No, that couldn't be farther from the truth. These are delivered straight to your door, they're never frozen, they're chef prepared, they're dietitian approved, and most importantly, these taste amazing. This is chicken parmesan that came out of the microwave. It's not rubbery, it's not dry, in fact it is perfect. I would have never been able to tell this came out of the microwave. This is magic. If you want to try a factor for yourself, and I highly recommend it, go to factor75.com slash agingwheels50 to get 50% off your first box. And thanks again to Factor for, to stop licking my hand. And thanks again to Factor for sponsoring this video and sending me wonderful boxes of delicious food. Oh my God. <laughs> you think I'm exaggerating. These are really good meals. Now to install the AEM control board in the first drive unit. When I ordered these drive units, I had them include these pigtail harnesses for like an extra hundred bucks, and I don't need them, so that was wasted money. Just a little bit of corrosion on this connector, so it was a little bit stuck. By the way, the instructions from AEM are guiding me through every step of this. Oh, there we go. Oh, say hello to the inverter portion of a Tesla drive unit. Three inverters, one for each phase. Now can you see why I chose to make fun of it for being inefficiently packaged? Because these flat boards are arranged in a triangle and there's nothing in the middle of that triangle. It's just hollow, it's just dead air. I don't know why they chose to package it like that and truthfully it doesn't matter, but there you go. And by the way, I was looking at these inverter boards thinking, wow, that's a lot of epoxy on there. That's not epoxy. It's some sort of liquidy gooey stuff. Got a lot of sticktivity to it. None of that matters. We're here for the control board. This is the stock control board, and the main reason we need to replace it is all of the torque limiting and mapping values are hard-coded onto this board. It accepts the throttle inputs directly, and it can't change anything about it. Out goes the stock board, complete with the EMI shield. Here's the new AEM board. I can fully control this one. Actually, I think their motto is take control. Plug everything in, and screw back into place. And I'm going to tighten these by hand just for safety. Oh no! I avoided the warranty! <laughs> and to ensure proper spacing, I'm going to do the same thing I did last time but forgot to show. I'm going to put in this little shim here as a spacer that I cut on the arc droid. While I would love to continue building drive unit mounts using this light plastic mock-up, I printed it in about 21 different pieces and glued them all together, meaning the distance between the mounting holes is not accurate enough for me to rely on them. So I need to take this one out of here and put the real one in its place, which I don't want to do because it weighs a million pounds. Done! That actually wasn't that bad. I didn't think about it when I did it, but since I cut away most of the floor, I had tons of access from the bottom and the top, making this a lot easier. Right now it's being held in place by the one mount that's fabricated and three strap points on the top.
That's the mount that I'm least proud of, but that's okay because it's the least important. The rear mount and the front mount have to handle 3,000 pound-feet of wheel torque. This mount has to hold up this end of the drive unit. So I think it can do that just fine. But why did I make this mount in two pieces bolted together? Glad you asked. Because of this front mount here, the drive unit to fit it in place doesn't just go up, it has to go up and then slide forward. If that mount was one welded together piece, well, this drive unit would never be able to come out or go in if it wasn't already mounted in place. So I chose to bolt it into two halves rather than have it one solid welded piece that's bolted to the subframe because that subframe sheet metal is a little bit too thin to tap threads into and there was no obvious place to put a captive nut in there. So rather than have the whole mount as one piece and then bolt to the subframe, I chose to have it welded to the subframe and the second half of the mount bolts in place. Now you might be thinking, those mounts don't look very good. And I don't disagree with you, but it doesn't matter. They're on the underside of the car and all they need to do is hold these drive units in place and resist the enormous torque that they exert. And they hopefully do that. I don't know, I could take this thing out for a test drive, romp on it, hear a very loud noise and come back home with an escape that's forcefully converted itself to front wheel drive. I hope that doesn't happen. One thing that bothers me a little bit is because of this flange right here. I couldn't make this mount go straight up to connect to this brace. I had to make it come out to the side and then cantilever over to connect to this brace. And I tried to add these little triangulation wings to strengthen it up. But if I had to do it again, I'd move these triangulation wings down here closer to the stress point, And I'd make this piece and this piece one solid piece. But as it is right now, I have 90% confidence in this mount holding up. Do I want to spend an extra day remaking a new mount to achieve 100% confidence? Yes, I do. I did. Here's the new one. It looks much better. Not an important metric, but it does look good and that makes me feel nice. I made this one completely differently than the old one. Rather than using the Arctroid's tracing functionality to make a crudely hand-drawn looking thing, I drew this design up in light burn, cut out a prototype on the laser out of plywood, and then made sure this fit, and then I transferred that file that I made in light burn over to the Arctroid and cut out these two pieces here. This one looks a lot better, but most importantly, it's gonna be a lot stronger than this one. Each side of this brace bolts into holes for the trailer hitch frame on either side, so I know it'll be strong enough. And the reason for these weird little standoffs is the surface of those holes is not flat. So I have these little standoffs here so it can sit flush on that surface. And I moved these tension support wings to directly above the mount point rather than off to the side like was bothering me with the original one that's over here out of the screen. Under heavy acceleration, this mount point will be forced downward with about a ton of force, if not more or less, I'm not an engineer. And these wings will be under tension pulling on the mounting holes on either side. This mount I only had 90% confidence in. This one is much closer to 100% and it's prettier. And relieve the pressure. It is firmly mounted now. As you're definitely aware, because you definitely watched the last video, the end goal of all this electrification is to electrify the bus. To that end, I had a few commenters in the last video ask me, why don't you just modify the diesel engine instead of mucking about with all this electric motor nonsense? Well, first of all, I want to. It's as simple as that. I like electric motors. But let's look at numbers. The Caterpillar C7 diesel engine in this bus produces 210 horsepower and 520 pound-feet of torque. The dual motor setup that I'm going to be using produces 900 horsepower and 660 pound-feet of torque. Well, that's not that much more than the diesel engine. And you're right, but you're looking for torque in all the wrong places. The Allison 2000 transmission in this bus is a four-speed with overdrive. The gear ratio of each of its five speeds is as follows. The rear end ratio is 5.125 to 1. So if we multiply those two numbers together, we get an overall drive ratio as follows in each gear. Each gear reduction is a torque multiplication. So if we take the 520 pound-feet of torque number that this engine can output and multiply it by each gear ratio, we get the theoretical wheel torque in each gear as follows. Almost 10,000 pound-feet of torque in first gear. Now, real quick, these numbers are not realistic. They're idealistic. They're not accounting for drivetrain loss, which in this bus would be about 20% or so. And they're assuming the engine's gonna be in its peak torque band at all times, which of course is not the case. But their numbers are good for comparison's sake. Now let's look at the electric stuff. The drive units will have a 4.5 to one gear reduction. Combine that with the 5.125 in the rear end, we get an overall gear reduction of 23.0625 to one. Combine that with the 660 pound-feet of torque number, we get a wheel torque of 
15,000 pound feet. 50% more than the diesel engine setup makes in first gear. Now, while I'd like to say this means that the bus at all speeds will have 50% more wheel torque than the diesel engine setup has in first gear, that's not quite true because the torque of the electric motor starts to taper off at higher speeds. By how much? I don't know. But if we assume that it's cut in half at 60 miles an hour, well, that's still triple the amount of wheel torque than this current setup has in fourth gear. No amount of diesel modification is going to get me to these numbers. And if it could, the transmission would blow up because it's only rated for 620 pound-feet. In the Escape, because I'll be using the stock Tesla gearing of 9.73 to 1 going straight to the wheels, that means the wheel torque will only be 1,600 pound-feet per wheel. 3,200 pound-feet per axle, 6,400 pound-feet of wheel torque overall. Now to do the same thing on Drive Unit 2, starting by removing this harness that I didn't need to buy. Oh, that came out a lot easier than the last one. The control board's installed in this one, but I'm not done with this motor yet because this is the front motor and it'll be mounted backwards, which means it'll be running in reverse, which causes no issues except for the oil pump in the gearbox. It's designed to run in one direction, and since I'll be running it in the other direction, that's a problem. So I bought this from Zero EV in the UK. It's a reverse oil pump for the Tesla drive unit. It uses the internals from the stock oil pump, but it's just a different housing, which is great, but it means that now I have to split the gearbox in half to install this little thing. Surprise! I took the inverter housing off again, and I'm so glad I did, because there's a sensor right about here with two wires that go to the main control board. I think this is a coolant temperature sensor. Doesn't matter. One of the wires got sandwiched in between the inverter housing and the gearbox housing, and I stripped it wide open. So I fixed that with some liquid electrical tape. Thankfully, I didn't sever the wire. I just grounded it on the case, which would have made this sensor, whatever it is, not work. But anyway, the reason I took the inverter housing off is because this small bundle of signal wires goes through the gearbox and connects to the motor on the other side. So I need to watch this when I split the gearbox in half. This wraps around the inverter and connects to the control board on the other side. I missed a bolt! This is a problem. I didn't even see that in there. And that goes behind the diff, so I have to take the diff off. Hey, while I'm in here, why don't I buy a Quaif, li Quaif Limited Slip Diff to put in here? Oh, right, because it's $3,000. Open diff it is. There we go. Age-old question, will I be able to catch this, or is it going to fly across the room? We shall find out together. There we go, I caught it. This is the oil pump, by the way. Here's the stock oil pump, cast out of aluminum or zinc or something, and here is the milled and polished aluminum reverse oil pump. Now I need to take the internals out of this and put it into this one. Ooh, there we go. Oil pump. Oh yeah, the oil groove goes in a different direction. There's the concentric bit. How does that work? Ooh, like that. Okay, there's that bit. Can I just... Yes, like that. And this slots down in here, and now that I'm looking at it, I can see that the shaft is in a different spot on each one. Very slightly different, but a different spot nonetheless. Internals are swapped. Now this can go back in. Off camera, I did put these little roll pins back in. Okay, off camera, I got the diff back in. I also got the oil pump drive gear back in, and I spread all the black RTV around here. Now, join me as I struggle to put it all back together. Oh no! Oh boy. But I gotta get at that cable to pull it through. Oh no! Oh no! Okay. All the stress added by the RTV hardening as I speak. I can't handle it. Piece of shit. Ah, I got it! Oh, done! That kind of sucked, actually. That was more struggle than I thought it was gonna be. But the reverse oil pump is installed now, as well as the AIM control board. Hopefully I didn't screw anything up because I struggled quite a bit in there. And hopefully the gearbox doesn't leak because I don't want to do that all again. Looks like mounting this front drive unit is going to be a little less straightforward than the rear one. I can see that this brace needs to be clearanced, which is annoying because then I can't count on its factory engineered structural integrity. But let's start with the rearmost mount. That's wrong. And that, that no, that's wrong. This needs to be thicker, that needs to be higher. 
much better. Just like in the back, I don't trust the dimensions of the plastic model, so I threw the real thing in there, and it's being held in place by the one mount that I've already made and an engine support bar. It must be illegal. It's an engine support bar. You can't use it for motors. Good news! This bar fits now. Didn't before. Don't know how it fits now, but I'm not going to question it because it clears. By this one bolt on the inverter cover, about two millimeters of clearance, but that's enough. I'm going to build the front mount onto this bar like I planned, and I don't have to cut anything off of it. How nice. That's that side done. Now I need a bracket for the other side of the mount to go down to here. There we go. Let's look at those mounts. Here's the rearmost mount, the strongest of them. Under heavy acceleration, the rear end of this drive unit will be pushing down on this mount. Now it does come out quite far. It's welded on right here to the bottom of the subframe and then sticks out past the steering rack here and then kind of swoops up underneath it. I think it's strong enough because I added this boxing piece at the bottom. But if you think I should add a little extra brace underneath here, maybe to mount to the side of the subframe or something, let me know. I think it's strong enough. This mount, while this connection to this bar is rigid as can be, this mount will have compliance because not only is this rubber isolated, but this mount is also rubber isolated. This strut in this position right here was one of the original engine mounts for the V6 in the Escape. And as such, there's compliance for NVH. So under heavy acceleration, the front end of the drive unit will be pitching upward. And because this mount is off to the side of this bar here, that means it'll be applying a twisting force like that. And because of all the rubber mounting in here, it will comply and it will twist under heavy acceleration. This will be moving as I'm driving the car. And this mount holds up this end of the drive unit. It'll do that job just fine. There's very little strength in this direction, but I wanted it that way because this mount will be moving. I wanted some compliance in this mount to also move. I now have a dual motor Ford Escape. But you probably already noticed an issue. Ain't nothing connected to these motors to the wheels. I need CV shafts. So I've measured all four corners and sent those measurements off to a specialty drive shaft shop, which is going to make me four custom CV axles. Now there's lots of cheaper ways that I could adapt my own CV axles, but this has to handle a lot of torque applied in an instant. So I'm going to do it the right way in the right way happens to be very expensive, unfortunately. This is the stack of sheet metal panels I took off the sides of the bus, and I'm not gonna be reusing these. So. The main goal of this project is to take what I learned on the escape and apply it to the bus. This is the literal representation of that. It's an escape on a bus. 
a piece of the bus anyway. I'm selling these, there'll be a link in the description below this video if you want to help pay for specifically the batteries in the Escape. That's what this fundraiser is all about. The batteries are going to be very expensive, and this won't pay for all of it, but it'll certainly help. You'll have two styles to choose from, mostly yellow, i.e. cut from one of the stock yellow school bus panels, or mostly uh, yellow, primer, bondo, bare metal, whatever it was. These were cut out of the two panels that I completely screwed up last year. I tried to patch all the screw holes, but in the process of doing that, I dumped way too much heat into the panel from welding, and I tried to fix that warping that the heat created by bondoing and sanding back and primering, and I ended up failing entirely. And I'm glad that I decided to go with brand new sheet metal panels because <laughs> here's one of the pieces that I cut out. It's two millimeters thick of solid Bondo across the entire piece. Most of these pieces are not solid Bondo. They're more of a mismatch like this one or this one. And most of these solid yellow panels aren't solid yellow. They've got little bits from what was behind the rub bars or screw holes or whatever. Every piece is different. And just like always when I do something like this, my top tier patrons get one automatically just for being so awesome. They're getting the Bondo variety because it's more personal, tells more of a story. Here's a piece of my mistake. This one I think has like three patched holes on it or two. It's really warped. This will help me out, but there's no obligation to buy one of these things. I just thought this was a more fun, more interesting way to raise money for something rather than the ordinary t-shirt. And I did all of this myself. You can probably hear the laser running in the background because I'm still making these things. And that's it for this video. While I did get better at the motor mounts as I went along, they still took me an average of roughly one and a half days per motor mount. Now, it doesn't help that I absolutely went to school on the first two mounts. I had to remake the first one twice. I only had to remake the second one once. I mean, the rest of them, I got them right the first time, so I, I got better as I went along, but it still took me, even as I got better, a full day per motor mount. So these things just take time. But that section, that part of the project, is done now. The next big part of the project that I'm, I wouldn't say worried about, but is daunting, is the battery boxes. There's a lot to it. i got to figure out where all the batteries will go. I think... Two thirds of them are gonna go under the escape and the remaining third will go in the engine bay, assuming I have enough room for that many modules in here and I don't have the batteries yet. I also have to make the aluminum boxes the batteries are gonna go into. I gotta make those structurally sound. Gotta figure out where to mount them on the body and all the places they're gonna go. I have to make cooling plates, again, out of aluminum. There's gonna be a lot to it. So I don't know if the next video will be battery box building or if I'm going to give myself a little bit of a break while I learn how to TIG weld and do some other things and tackle some smaller stuff on the car like power steering and power brakes, which I have to tackle at some point. I might just do it for the next video. I'm not sure. We'll have to all find out together when the next video is released in about a month, month and a half, somewhere along there. See you next time. Thanks for watching.